When we're dealing with suicide, the question always comes up. This is probably the, the most familiar question you get is will it send a Christian to hell? Or does, did that person go to hell? Or did he go to heaven? When you're dealing with someone like that and they're asking the question, you gotta be careful because you need to find out what is the person thinking? What's the motive behind the question? They may be thinking about suicide and you don't wanna lead them down a path that leads them to suicide. And so uh, that, that's an issue that you need to be aware of because suicide is a sad fact. Some Christians have committed suicide. They, uh, they, they're asking questions because they're in despair, they, they got anguish in their heart, whatever, they've lost hope, and so they're just, they're just floating around trying to figure out what they want to do. Um, but there are problems with suicide, lots of them. Um, unconfessed sin, when we don't confess our sins daily, we're not getting forgiveness for our sins. Those sins build up, right? Um, some people say it's the unpardonable sin. Now, this is a theological problem here, this, this idea of the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is when you have uh, rejected the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's the unpardonable sin. If, if you're still wondering, you've not rejected the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is still working with you. If you've got questions about something, you're not committed to unpardonable sin. Don't worry about that. Most Christians worry way too much about the unpardonable sin. It's amazing how much grace God gives, and he gives us that grace. Uh, it is evil. It is evil to murder, because it is murder. Suicide is self-murder. And so we have a problem with that as well. But you gotta ask them this question. What makes one say? Go ahead and answer this one yourself. What, how do you know you say? I know that I know that I know. Confess your sins and ask Jesus into your heart. Okay. So you believe in? Yes. yes. By faith. By faith. In Christ yeah. alone. I mean, that is salvation. And that he gives you the spirit to live a righteous life. A lot of people get one part right and not the other part. The one part is the good, the confessing and asking for salvation, but they're not good at trying to follow Christ. Or they're trying to follow Christ, but they're trying to do it in their own strength and they're not asking for forgiveness. So it's a balance there that we have in our life that helps us to get to where we need to be as a Christian. Uh, John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. So, this idea of going to hell, if you're going to go to hell, you got to be condemned, right? What does that say? What is it telling us about condemnation? There is no condemnation if we believe in Christ, right? And so, we just need to get it in our mind where we stand with God and then you don't have to worry about uh, suicide. That is not what God wants. If you're entertaining the idea of suicide, you're entertaining a, an idea of uh, that is against God's will for sure. Okay, so how can we know for sure that we have salvation? Well, this one comes from 1 John chapter 5. Verse 13 through 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So we can know that we're saved by our relationship, our walk with him. And as we walk with him, we're asking him of things. Lord, give me hope. Lord, give me peace. Lord, give me the opportunity to share the gospel. Lord, give me the opportunity to study the Bible. When we're asking things that are in his will, he's going to provide that. It's a done deal. You're going to get it. And so that keeps us away from it even getting to the point of suicide. All right. What can separate us from God? What can See. What? Sin. Sin can. Can separate us from God. Separates us not from God, but from the joy of our salvation. Right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. This verse says for Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you a created being? Yes. If you're a created being, that's in the list. No created being can separate us from the love of God. You can't even separate yourself from the love of God. He has that ability. So, what about suicide in the Bible? Well, I was looking it up and I found six occasions that are in the Bible. And we're not going to look at all these Bible verses, but these are examples of people that uh, had considered committing suicide, uh, that actually did commit suicide. Okay, the most famous, of course, is Saul. Um, God's the giver of life, so if we're going to take our life, it's uh, a violation of what God had intended for that person. So a person that actually does it is committing a grievous offense against God. Um, Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So everything that you have, your, your personality, uh, your your deepest pain, <laughs> everything. It comes directly from God. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's coming from God. Accept it as a gift from God. And that's where we get a, a messed up in our thinking. Uh, that's why people go down the suicide road. They get to the place where they are in despair. Do Christians go through despair? Yes. yes. All right. Well, you know, I, I listen to some Christians, and it's like if, if you don't say bless the Lord all the time, you know, and you're not upbeat and positive and and, and projecting this, I'm good, and I'm, you know, I got my stuff together, that there's, you know, there, you're not really a good Christian. You're just participating. We're glad you came. <laughs> well, that's not Christianity. That's not real. That's plastic. It's, it's, uh, it's not who we are. Uh, we do despair, don't we? All right. Well, Solomon, Elijah, Jonah, and then I just quit because there was a bunch of them. They, <laughs> there was a bunch of them. I didn't even get very far in the Old Testament. And I'm thinking... There's so many examples of people that were in despair. Paul Jonah, he didn't want to preach to the Ninevites, and he got real depressed with God, went out and sat under the juniper tree, remember that? And God provided shade for him. What happened? A worm come along, eat the roots, the juniper tree died, and then he complained to God because he just wanted to die. <laughs> because he didn't want to uh, preach to the Ninevites. Well, that's the kind of things that we get involved in. We let circumstances drive us down into despair. 
And when we're so focused on our own problem, you might go down that road. All right? Or anything else that would drive us down that way. Just our focus, what else could drive us that way? Health issues. Health issues. Medications. Yeah. Injuries. Selfishness. Sir? Selfishness. Selfishness, yeah. Emotional issues. Self-centeredness. Um, lots of things will drive you to despair. When, when your expectations are, are way high and what you get is way low. And so you're trying to balance your life out and you just get uh, just knocked out of shape. You mentioned medication. I don't know how many people, you know, been on drugs. You know, I have at one time in my life. But there was a point in time in which, you know, that is something I considered because I got tired of being on that very go around. Same thing, doing the same, the insanity of it. Doing the same thing, trying to get a different effect, every, different effect every time you do it. And it gets to be just a revolving door. And emotionally, it drains you, you know, you're embarrassed, you hurt your family, you know. You've, it, it just takes you to points in which that's why you medicate. And then medication gets you worse than you were. Yeah. Sun's coming up tomorrow. <laughs> you know, what's he gonna do? You're still in that same. Yeah, and it's 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 a big problem. And in America, uh, a lot of times somebody gets hurt for, on a job or whatever. The doctor sub subscribes opioids. Mm -hmm. You get addicted to the opioids, and then then there's this vicious cycle of of the the opioids aren't doing the job, so you increase the dosage and it, it, you get used to it and you increase the dosage and that now you're addicted to it and now it's affecting your your marriage and it's affecting your work and it's affecting all kinds of things and you start spiraling downward into this dark deep depression that people fall into it happens and so does that mean if they commit suicide that God's taking their soul, throwing it in hell. Did they uh, commit the unpardonable sin of, of, of self-destruction? Well, nobody knows for sure what happens to people when they die. I can't tell you, even if you project to me the very best Christian attitude that you're going to heaven. I don't know. I'm not the judge. God's the only one who judges the heart. But when you're dealing with the spouse of, of someone who committed suicide, you don't want to tell them that we don't know. <laughs> We're trying to give them hope. Is it false hope to say that what we knew of that person was that they were a good godly man, that, that they're going to be with that uh, God in heaven? Is that false hope? I think it is. Why? Because you don't know. It's true. Only God knows. So what do we say to someone? I don't know. You tell us. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Well, I mean, you could say we don't know for sure, but I know his heart. You know, I know all of you guys in this room. I'd say every one of you, if for some reason you got so despaired and you committed suicide, tomorrow I'm still going to believe that, that all of you guys are in heaven. I'm going to believe that. Now, it's a belief. I don't know. And I can share my belief with the spouse, right? And they have to accept it as my belief because I don't know and that's what you do is you go to the spouse and you tell them we don't know but it's my belief they're in heaven I think uh, uh, belief and our belief in God I mean it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that faith. he's gracious it's faith yes. you know 
that's a belief that's great inside of me that that is my belief. I can't sit here and look at you and you go like, well, yeah, I know you can see fruits, you can, but that's, you're looking at me right now. You know, you're not with me 24 seven. Not with anybody in your 24 seven. You never know what someone's gonna do. So you can't really say that, but you hope and believe. But I mean, you can be married to someone and think you know them and be surprised by some of the actions they do. So, but to the best of your knowledge, you believe that they are in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what you say to people. And because you're offering. You want to comfort them. You don't want to give them false hope. Don't want to give them false hope. You're right. And, and so we just tell the truth. But we do it with love. We don't know, but I believe it. <laughs> and that's what I do. I just tell them I believe it. Um, I could be wrong. I could be. But what harm have I done? By saying I believe. I just know that every funeral, you know, some of these people have died and never set foot inside the church or how they live. And, you know, they give the best eulogy. He was such a good man. And sometimes you sit back and you go, like, no, he wasn't. <laughs> but we, I kind of wonder about that. It don't matter. It's just, I guess, you're giving relief to the family, but most of the family knows. Well, there's, there's and sometimes see, it's best to be quiet. Exactly. Yeah, yeah mama, mama said that, didn't you? Mama said, uh, you know, if you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. You know, that's what mama always says. But, you know, we don't have... This, this is what I'm talking about. When we're talking about suicide, we're talking about a theology that that we have concrete evidence of how God works. And we have concrete evidence uh, of how people have lived in front of us. We can make judgments. Are we supposed to make judgments? No. Why not? Because God says you will be judged how you judge someone. Matthew 7, 1 says, Judge not, lest you be judged by the same judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then it goes on down, verse 3, telling us how to judge. So yes, we do judge things. We judge things over and over again. Three Verses 3 through 7 actually are telling you specific ways on how to do judgment correctly. And so we do judge how things are in the lives of the people that we deal with. That's not to say that we say judgments to hurt their feelings or to to uh, point out sin in their life. That is not the purpose of judgment. Judgment is to bring us to wisdom, the wisdom of God. And so that's how we get there. All right, so we have to understand that salvation is the planning of God's word in the heart. And it's like a plant. It just grows. But just like when you got a, a field of weed out there and it's growing, storms come along, will that affect the growth of that field? Yeah. It will. And when storms come along in the life of people that you're dealing with, it will affect them. It will affect them very much. Despair, fear, or pain, it doesn't matter. It affects people. And it affects Christians. We are not immune. We will suffer. We all suffer. And so we have to face that. It's a tough life that we live. Just, despair can happen to anyone. This one, Psalms 50, is very helpful when you're dealing with someone that's going through this kind of thing. It says, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. So when you're going through the pain, you're going through the trial, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Call out to him. Ask for help. He'll send you somebody to help you get through it. He'll send you the spirit that you need to overcome it. 
He'll send you the strength that you need to get through it. You just have to do it. All right, so I got some questions here. So I'm going to read the question. You guys answer them, okay? Y'all ready for this? All right, Judas Iscariot. The disciple who betrayed Jesus. Y'all didn't know that, right? Uh, who committed suicide? But also walked with Jesus. Should we categorize his destination as death as unknown? Do we know the destination of Judas Iscariot? What do you think? I think we do. Okay, tell me why you think we do. Because I don't remember the, the exact verses, but Christ is talking about the ones that the ones that God gave him he kept and it mentions that only, the only one that, that was Judas but Judas was never his so I would think that, that would be him. also what is required for salvation faith yeah but more What's required for salvation repentance. that he didn't do? Repentance. repentance. You have to repent of your sin, turn and follow him. Um, he never did repent. He could have repented and then committed suicide, but that's not the way it worked. He he didn't he didn't repent. He went away in despair and he went away as he was sorry for what he did, yeah. but he didn't repent of what he did. There's a difference between the two. Right? Yeah. He was sorry. He threw the coins down on the ground and said he didn't want them. Uh, but that's not repentance. That's just anger. <laughs> yeah, that's anger. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but are you judging Judas? Yeah, we can. <laughs> right. <laughs> because we don't really know if he repented or not. He could very well be an enemy. But we're judging the circumstances. We're not, we're not categorizing Judas as being worse than anybody else. We're all sinners. What we're judging is for wisdom. That's the point of the judgment. The, the judgment is not to, to put him in a category as a bad person. We're all bad people, so just get rid of that idea. We're judging for the purpose of wisdom so that we'll know how to lo lo live our life. Okay? So yeah, judgment's okay. We might have to do a study on Matthew 7. <laughs> Well, to add to what you said, um, that he, he never said that he was his. Well, so does that mean that you just didn't believe in Christ? I mean, he, he would believe. I think you can. You look at the world today, and they say that, you know, the, the uh, Islam, they believe that Christ was a prophet. There's a lot that believe he's a prophet. They believe as a person, but they don't believe in him as the Savior. Right. They don't believe in him as the Son of God. And I, I mean... So I'm just... I, I, and I get that, but I just wonder if, if Jesus did. Well, he, he walked with Jesus and he saw the miracles that Jesus did. But it goes right, right back to what you said in that, you know, he did throw his money down, but the lesson for all of us is when we mess up, we have to ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, it's held against us. That's right, so every day. Every day. Okay, so Judas also showed evidence throughout his life that he wasn't really a follower of Christ, but he was a follower of power and prestige and money. Yeah. And those were evident in his life as well when we read the gospel accounts. And so we, we look at and most scholars today uh, look at Judas and say that he was not a Christian. Um, we don't know that with all the Bible characters. We don't know. It's not enough evidence there. But uh, those that have committed suicide doesn't automatically mean that, that you are uh, in hell. All right. So then the second question, he says, should suicide in general be unknown? as far as destination after death, because only God can judge the heart of man. Or would we automatically consider them in hell due to the fact that we're giving to a debased mindset, allowing them to do such a thing? 
Now, if they have a debased mindset and it allows them to commit suicide, does that send you to hell? No, because it, it, it's stated in Scripture that God will turn you over to the flesh, to, to destroy the flesh, so that the Spirit might live. Okay, so, so you don't want to go down that road, I mean, you might get so bad. All right, so you, you, you've got to ask them. What is this debased mindset? What is that? You can't understand the truth. Disparage. When, when did you receive this debased mindset? When you get so far along that you turn your back against the Lord and you just keep going downhill. You don't ever turn around. Is it when you get so far along in your sin, or is it at birth? Sin. Now, are we, are we talking about it's not at birth. We're talking about it. Is original sin not part of the debased mindset? Well, it could be, but you just keep committing the same sin or more sin over and over and over, and you don't change it, turn your life around, and sooner or later, he's going to give up on you. He's going to turn you over to your way of thinking. So you're going down the wrong road to begin with. Okay, did not God establish before the foundations of the earth, before he even created it, who was going to be saved, the elect? Well, I think he knew who would get saved, mm -hmm. but I don't think he picked you to be saved. Okay. He knew somewhere along my walk, when I got to a certain age, I would finally realize that, hey, Fred, you can't do it on your own. You've got to have someone in your life who can give you direction. Mm -hmm. He knew that I would do that and when. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he picked me out then saying, Fred, you'll be saved. He knew, but I don't think you're chosen at that particular time. Okay. That's my pick. That's my thinking. Yeah. What? Well, and it's in Romans. It says that that we were predestined. That's the word it uses. Set apart, sanctified, right? Glorified. It's already established. Yeah. I, I get that, and I, I know it's free will and everything, but there is free will. Yeah, we're not denying free will. Exactly, but if it's a total thing like you know this was going to be said this is going to, why would god create a soul that had a choice to for them to spend eternity in hell i mean if each person didn't have the same equal choice well we're we're not god so we yeah, don't yeah, we, I, I know. We, know, we don't know what's in that person's heart and so them committing suicide for us, brings up a a uh, it's a crisis for us when someone commits suicide. It's a crisis for us because we love this person and we don't know what to do because we love them and we're thinking, were they saved or were they lost? And so the the judgments in this question is that. It was a mindset, a debased mindset that caused them to do this thing against God. Well, I'm thinking we all have that debased mindset. We were born with it. None of us are going to heaven except that God does it in us. He performs a work in us. We all agree with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. God's the one doing it. I, not my good works. Nothing I can do will get me to heaven. It's not Christ plus me. It's Christ and Christ alone. And so that debased mindset thing is, is focusing in on the sin itself as being the cause. We all have the cause. Right? Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's look at this next one. He says, would suicide be blasphemy if the person is a believer? Them admitting by their own action Christ isn't enough to withstand the trials of life. Now, is that fair to the person who committed suicide? Can we walk in the, 
did Paul himself not say that we despaired even of life in the book of Acts? That's what he said. Sometimes we go through things that are very hard to deal with. I remember when I was in Charlotte, uh, <laughs> my business got ruined, my, uh, my house was about to lose it to the mortgage people, uh, my wife was just gone crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I was living in a panel van for three months. I was miserable. It was cold. I was hungry. I was taking my baths into McDonald's. I was in despair, and I was thinking about how can I end it? I, I'd been driven down into despair, and there's not a person in this room could know what I felt. You can't feel that. You have to go through a person's life and, and know what they're going through You know, and, and then make that judgment. You can't just say, say Jesus ain't enough. You're not thinking about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is uh, certainly in your life. And yes, everybody follows him from afar. Peter, did he follow from a distance? You know, he, he might have been considering suicide. When you're facing depression or something like that, all you can think about is self. Yeah. You can't think of nothing else. It's not humanly possible. No, it's not. And when you're on drugs because of a pain or injury of some kind, you're thinking, this is hard. This is real hard, and I don't think I can do it anymore. That's what you're thinking. And you're looking for a, a, a way out, a relief, just so it won't quit hurting. Anybody have, ever had... Intense pain? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, intense, intense pain. And so, I, I, I feel sympathetic to the person who's going through it. Um, Christ is enough, and he can get you through it. Um, you just have to cling on, and hold on as hard as you can. All right, here's another one. He says, if every believer would enter heaven after committing suicide, why don't we all just do that? Jim Jones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Why don't we just commit suicide? If we're, we're that's believing. kind of what he said. When those 700 people died. Mm -hmm. Let's go be with Christ. Yeah, but he wasn't really following Christ. Yeah. Yeah, well, of course not. But I mean, mm -hmm. that's how far people mm -hmm. get in their minds to listen to someone like that that's supposedly trying to tell you about Christ. But, you know, that, that's an interesting question. But again, it comes from the idea that you have some control over whether you're going to heaven or not. You don't have that control. What you have is a faith or a belief and an, a willingness to react to what God's word says, which means you repent and you follow him. Those are the things that you have control over. You have no control over whether you go to heaven or to hell. God does. God's the judge and he will judge. What you have control over is your life. And your life is not to get to heaven faster. <laughs> you, you might not make it that way. You know, that's not the way it works. You, your, your job is to follow Christ. Learn more about what he's doing. It gives you wisdom to follow Christ. It, and it's not just uh, quick, easy answers. And I think sometimes uh, that's what we're looking for. All right, what, what do you think? Well, I mean, you know, if every Christian has decided to take their own life, then how are we following the Bible and discipling people? If it just, every Christian killed themselves, then that would just, everybody else from there on out go to hell? <laughs> I mean, is that the, is that what you want to take to heaven, that you ended your life so you couldn't share Jesus? I think if, if every 
Christian in just South Carolina committed themselves to suicide. Um, every other state would outlaw uh, Christianity. And so Christianity would stop spreading. Right. So the very idea that you can manipulate getting into heaven quicker and easier without going through all the pain and suffering of life is, is fallacy. It's just simply fallacy. It's not going to spread the gospel. It's not, it is still self-centered. It's not thinking about what others would do. The best way to win others to Christ is to go through the pain. Go through the suffering. Go through the hardship. And glorify God. Isn't that what the psalmist said? That he will give you help to get through it so that you can glorify God? That's what we're supposed to do. So you believe that somebody that commits suicide has cut their life short or you believe it was their time anyway and they would have went in a different kind of way? That's a good question. Uh, obviously God allowed it. But yeah, I think they cut their life short. I think they did. Um, and unnecessarily, regardless I've had multiple suicides uh, that I've had to deal with, and um, I've never understood any of them. And all of them impacted me personally very powerfully. Um, they just, uh, I don't understand. Never will understand. It makes no rational sense, other than the fact that I know they were hurting and they were trying to deal with the pain. Um, but usually it's just a momentary thought. If someone had been there at that moment, but they weren't. Yeah, but sometimes uh, it's... something that's been thought out or attempted multiple times. You know, now maybe not for a Christian, but you know, just in the world. Now, the, statistically, teenagers are, are committing suicide more than anybody else. Why is that? I mean, they haven't even experienced pain yet. <laughs> not experienced I think it has to do with peer pressure, social media. Lack of full in, yeah, family at home, weak families, social media, peer pressure—all those are good answers. Life is probably tougher now for teenagers than it ever has been uh, because um, they're more isolated. I mean, when I was a kid, John, I remember going to school and every school. Every kid in the school was talking about Star Trek. Did you watch Star Trek last night? We all had a shared experience. It was only three stations back then, and we could only get two of them where I live. <laughs> and we watched Star Trek and went to school and talked about it. We all had this shared experience. You go to school now, is there one show everybody's watching? Well, that's a multiple. Yeah, it's just all <laughs> over the place, isn't it? So there's no shared experience anymore. We've talked about baseball, football. Everybody knew the, the same things. We had face-to-face -face conversation. Now they go on the phone, mm -hmm. the iPad, the laptop, or whatever. They communicate that way. Yeah. And so there's not this connectedness that we used to have. Uh -uh. You have to go somewhere to be connected, like go to church or go to work. Good. You're not connected to the grocery store. I'm not. I mean, I go every week. I even recognize a face or two. I don't know those people. <laughs> so our connections are less than they used to be. That's important. And so we just have to build up friendships. All right. Let's ask this question. How many of you have 
one close friend you could go to if you were in a deep, dark depression, you'd be willing to go talk to him. Okay. All right, so that's a thing. You need to have that. If you don't, um, uh, Satan's a predator. What do predators do? They separate the wheat <laughs> from the pack. They always get the weak one and pull them off the pack. And if you don't have a, a close relationship with people, that's what he'll do. He'll separate you. And he'll get you by yourself where you get in your own head and start thinking stupid. I think isolation too. It's like you said, it's mm -hmm. a big part of it. When you're out there on that island by yourself, and you don't have anybody to talk to. And it's like, you know, my sister mom sits in the house all day. When she gets off work, she sits in the house, plays with her cat. <laughs> don't want to come out. Yeah, I want to socialize. And she's doing a lot better now, but my point is, is we try to tell her, get out of the house. Go do something. Yeah. 